Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session, a Scalable Platform for Training and Inference Using Kubeflow at CERN. It's going to be presented by my colleague, Philippe, a senior research fellow with the Atlas Experiment at CERN, and me, Diana, a computing engineer in the Kubernetes team. So at CERN, we do many things, but at the core of everything that we're doing, we are always trying to answer the question, what is the universe made of and how does it work? Yeah, and it's my pleasure to take you now to CERN. It's located next to the Swiss Franco border, next to Geneva, and maybe it's most famous for hosting the Large Hadron Collider. It's a particle collider that smashes together protons at the energy frontier. And by doing that, it allows us to study what the fundamental building blocks of the universe are. So in the Large Hadron Collider, we have this tunnel where the protons rotate and cross the border 22,000 times per second with almost the speed of light. And they're brought to collision at four points where we have big cameras, particle detectors around them. And then we get data, three-dimensional pictures of these collisions and transfer the data to our data center. So in the data center, the data becomes knowledge and we create reconstructions out of these proton collisions and then can probe how the fundamental building blocks of the universe interact with each other. And at the end, we get data products like these plots that give us some insight about how these fundamental particles behave, such as the Higgs boson, which was discovered in 2012. So 2012 was a turning point for particle physics and for computer science. This is the year on, on, when on 4th of July, the discovery of Higgs bosons was announced. And by this completing the last missing piece of the theory of particle physics, the standard model. 2012 is also the year when AlexNet convolutional network was published and by this marking the beginning of the machine learning age. And with this in mind, our challenge right now is to try and reconstruct and identify Higgs bosons in the 3D photos of proton-proton collisions from the data we are getting from the particle detectors at the Large Hadron Collider. And to help us on this mission, we have John and we have Emma. John is a physicist at CERN who wants to analyze petabytes of data, data coming from LHC, and we have Emma, who is a software engineer at CERN, and she's maintaining central computing resources and software services. So as you can see, in 2012, there are only 27 papers, physics papers published, which are featuring both machine learning, deep learning, and neural terms, together with high energy physics. In 2023, just last year, this number grew up to 445. This year, it's March, and we are already um, above 100 papers published, which is absolutely great. So what can we do about it? Well, we start with some assumptions. First of all, we know that we want to do machine learning. Second, we need to run on-premise, and lastly, we want to give preference to open source projects. And with this in mind, this sounds like a great opportunity to use Kubeflow. The question now is, is it actually enough or do we need more than Kubeflow? To answer this question, we need to start by understanding what is it exactly that we want to do. It's time to cover some requirements. And requirement number one is, the platform should be able to manage the full machine learning lifecycle. So we're talking about getting the collected data, analyzing it, training and retraining, evaluating if the model is good enough, putting it into production, and then monitoring if it's, it's good enough or it needs improvements, and then orchestrating all of this into a lifecycle. Of course, in reality, probably it looks more like this, and this is still overly simplified, but for the sake of our mental health, we're gonna stick with a simpler version. And we can see that Kubeflow comes with solution for most of the steps in our life cycle. We can use Kubeflow pipelines for the collected data and for evaluating the models. We can use notebooks to analyze it. We can use PyTorch and TensorFlow for training and retraining. 
We can use CATIP for hyperparameter optimization, and then we can put it into production using NVIDIA Triton or KServe, and then we need to monitor. And monitoring is a tricky beast because there are many solutions, but most of them are not completely open source. From the last research that I've done, I saw that there is ML run, which tries to solve these problems. It's not currently used by us, at least not yet, but we'll see how it goes. Um, the main point here, as was already mentioned before, is that with Kubeflow, you have opportunity when you have a problem to have a solution, a project trying to solve this problem that is very well integrated with Kubeflow. So this all sounds like one precious Kubeflow to rule them all. Second requirement is the platform needs to be integrated with our CERN systems. We have certain storage systems, US or CERN VM file system. We are talking about integrating with our authentication and authorization systems and quota management. Because by default, you get access to just a small quota, but you need to have a clear way of requesting more. Requirement number three is the platform should be centralized which means all the teams should have a single place where they can access, run their experiments, and ex get access to a common pool of resources. This stimulates cross-department collaboration, but also this prevents a lot wasted efforts for in-house solutions. And because I think in this regard, centralizing the resources is so important, I'd like to go a bit into more depth. Why is this so important? So first of all, because getting GPUs is hard. So it's very important to reassign GPUs that are not used properly, or so-called idle GPUs. It's also important to try to do GPU sharing to increase the GPU offering. Of course, this comes with some problems, some constraints. Every user needs to understand what it means to use a shared GPU and not one dedicating GPU, but I think it's worth it. And last but not least, when you have a common pool of GPUs, it's easier to get access to many GPUs at the same time to do distributed training. Second point is bursting into cloud, which means the system can be more elastic, but also it means we get access to hardware that is so specialized or expensive or both, usually both, but it's absolutely impossible to get them on premise. And as a result, we have opportunity to get them on cloud. And of course, we get full control over the scheduling of resources, which means we can maximize for resource utilization while we minimize for carbon footprint. And requirement number four, the platform should be easy to use because more or less physicists are not usually very, very well advanced in the infrastructure. So it needs to be easy to use from the UI. And Kubeflow does a great job at providing this. We can create resources, we can uh, collaborate with our colleagues at CERN, and also we can just buy some clicks, some boxes, we can mount drivers, we can configure nodes, we can enable and disable integrations, which is absolutely great. So to recap, this is more or less our requirements. We want to do the full machine learning lifecycle. We need to be able to integrate with our CERN systems, we want to be able to have a centralized platform, more, mostly to have the GPU centralized in a common pool, and then the platform should be easy to use. And as you can see, there is a small question mark near requirement number four. And this is because for me, from the IT perspective, I think Kubeflow is pretty easy to use, but at the end of the day, it's not just for me to decide, but for our physicists that are using the system, that's why I would give a stage to Philip and John over here to try it out and let us know. Thank you very much, Diana. So as an experimental physicist, I now take over and make an experiment with John. So John works at CERN and wants to find out 
something about the Higgs boson because it's a fundamental particle that is at the heart of our current understanding how particles interact. It provides a mechanism that gives particles mass. And although it was discovered over 10 years ago, it's still a mystery and needs to be further investigated. So it's a real challenge to find Higgs bosons in all of these collision events we have from the Large Hadron Collider because these Higgs bosons decay instantly in yoctoseconds to B quarks another species of particles. And these quarks, also we don't see them ever, but we only see their tracks, their traces through the detector. So the challenge is to find these beauty quarks inside of all the collisions. Fortunately, these have a very peculiar property. And this is just the particle physics 101, because the focus is really how to utilize cube flow to do all of this. The thing is that Higgs bosons most frequently decay to these B quarks, and quarks, whenever they are created in one of the collision events, they initiate sprays of particles that go through the detector. So on the right-hand side, you see a picture, how we see it in the detector. The blue cones are so-called jets of particles that are each initiated by one of the B quarks. And these B quarks have the property that they live just very, very long. So if it were like a human it would live thousands of years, whereas other particles instantly decay to other particles, or they are, they are more stable on our time scales. But these B quarks, they travel a certain range through the detector, and then they decay to other particles. So they kind of have their special own place of decay. So we see one place where all of the particles from the Higgs boson and the collision decay, and move through the detector, and then a few millimeters next to it, we see a second place of such, such decays, and we can use machine learning to identify this particular signature. So we have one model that we call GN2, because we started with graph neural networks, and now we use attention with transformer models. And this architecture is trained with high fidelity simulation of these collisions and the Atlas detector. And we use one of these jets from the B quarks and then take all of the trajectories of the particles inside the jet, the spray of particles, and map it together with the jet. And then we feed all of this inside our transformer model with labels from simulation and train these millions of parameters for a long time. And as an output, we get three values that are high if it's a beauty quark, a different kind of quark, there's a background for us called a charm quark or some light flavor quark. So it's, it's signal versus background discrimination as a problem. And we do all of this by combining the jet properties with these low level tracks. So we have up to 40 tracks per jet that we use for the categorization. And when we initialize all of this in an embedding with the deep sets, go then in uh, the transformer architecture. And the beauty of this is that we have at the end different representations. So we either can categorize the whole jet as B, C, or light flavor initiated jet, but we also have auxiliary tasks that together and loss function help to classify the individual tracks, their origin, and also which of them come from a common decay vertex. So we have this primary vertex, and then, as you remember, the special second vertex for the B quarks. So this was all rather technical, just to provide a background. Um, this is what I like to call the propaganda plot, showing how within the years we evolved in performance. So we want to find the big jets and discriminate against charm jets and light flavor jets. And you see that from the initial attempts using fully connected neural networks up to the graph neural network tagger GN1, we have improved the performance by a factor of four leveraging this technology. And of course, the cost for this is that we need to train on large data sets. Fortunately, at CERN, we have both the data sets as, as well the technology to do this. And here um, comes in Kubeflow. So we use some software that is based on PyTorch and PyTorch Lightning. Uh, we have it configurable with YAML files. We use best practices like continuous integration and deployment, um, provide support as Onyx so we can deploy the trained model within the Atlas reconstruction software and identification of these B-Jets. And 
the nice thing is that all of this is containerized. So we have a GitLab instance that provides us with images of the software, and this is ideal to be used in Kubeflow. So this is a possible workflow. We have in GitLab this salt software where we then create images, Linux container images, and then these can be directly scheduled within Kubeflow to train and the input data sets, the training data sets and the validation data sets, we get either from storage from institute machines, from the EOS storage system at CERN, so from in-house solutions. Um, we can also use a OpenStack S3 type of storage and mount it. So there are different options how to go ahead. And once we have the training, then we can evaluate all of this using Jupyter notebooks that are also being served in Kubeflow. So I think the best way to show that you trust your infrastructure is to go for a live demo. So we are going to do exactly that. Um, I, I want to show first how to run this salt software. So we have um, here some, some pipelines that we are going to, to schedule if, if the Wi-Fi permits. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that with the trust uh, in the infrastructure because we just tried. Um, what I want to show is uh, a run of the pipeline, but I think while this is loading, I just show one of the pre-recorded fallback solutions. I would have been too nice. also seems to be challenged, but we're getting there. We have a little more time. So right before doing this, Ricardo said, this is very brave. Are you sure you want to do this? Um, but let's see. So we now have the pipeline uh, where we schedule with a YAML file um, the GitLab registry hosted image. And this is the command that we use for training everything. So we now create a run, schedule an experiment, and then we can monitor the run. Once we launch it with, let's, let's say we trade for five epochs. And here you see that we have now a container image that is being, being deployed. And as soon as it's running, we can see in the log the, the output. So you see here some information about the, the model. It's a simplified version with only 1.3 million parameters that are being trained. The, the data is being loaded. And uh, we evaluate then for five epochs and get the validation and the train loss. But I think at this point, it's just to show you how easy it is to, to use. So we just have YAML file where we configure everything. And then uh, this is running. Now we have the first epoch, which completed with just a small data set of, I think, a thousand entries for this demonstration. And you see that uh, we get the train and the validation loss with a timestamp. And in principle, we could use this now and also import it to a tensor board to see the loss uh, as a function of epoch decreasing if everything goes well. So that's one thing we can do. Um, I think I will not bore you with this and uh, just seeing the loss decreasing and this eventually converging. So I used um, some time before to pre-train and uh, we now see in Jupyter Notebook an evaluated version of the model on some test data set. Um, and in this, we import some plotting libraries. So you probably know pandas, numpy, and then uh, some H5 reader for the data sets. And we'll read this um, output from a similar model. And we can directly visualize it in the notebook to see how well this performed. So as I mentioned, we have three outputs from this transformer model 
uh, score for the B jet, for the charm jet, and for the light jet. We want to discriminate the B jets originating from the Higgs decay from the other two classes. So we construct a discriminant uh, and can compute then the efficiency for the signal class and the rejection of the background classes uh, and plot everything as a receiver operator characteristic curve. So doing that then provides us with uh, the plot as a PNG file and um, I'm just going to display it below. So what you see is for a certain efficiency of how many of the BJs from the Higgs decay you select, how well you can reject the light-flavored quark-initiated jets and the charm jets. And uh, this is, of course, not as good as the real performance, but shows that it's possible to train state-of-the-art classification architectures for particle physics. So I think with um, some... some um, excitement for the presenters, uh, we can say that indeed this technology works. It even works on a stage. Um, so I give back to Diana after this experiment. All right. So what is left to say is some conclusions to end with. So machine learning becomes a key technique in high energy physics. Cube flow we can see is does meet our requirements and needs. And the example over here, a transformer model for classification of jet flavor showcases that the platform can be utilized for physics data analysis. Thank you. This is for, for the dessert. And I believe, do we have time for questions? Well, I think we have a time for a couple of questions, so, yep, there's one there. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, super exciting. Uh, so, can you speak, I just saw on one of the slides that you speak about shareable PVC between notebooks and training workloads. So, can you please speak a little bit more how you use it and why it is useful for you? I'm sorry, we really Like, w one of your architecture diagram, you show that basically you use shareable PVC between notebooks and training, which allows you to easily scale your, you know, training scripts and distribute across workloads. So can you speak a little bit more how you can do it and how it supports with Qflow Notebooks today? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I believe it's just PVCs that can be mounted multiple times. Can you... Can yeah, if you, you can just maybe show the slide, I can yes. be more precise there. Yes, please. I'll go back. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, this one? Yeah, exactly. So my question is like, as you can hear, you're using like read write many PVC between your training workloads and notebooks. So my question is like exactly how you transfer the code from notebook to your distributed training workloads, right? And multiple machines. Um, but here it's read, read write many times. Mm -hmm. I think this is it. But do you use like notebooks directly on the train workloads or you use like a Python files there like? So, so the notebook we don't really use for the training. We have this salt software, which is just a wrapper around lightning. And uh, in this, we can use many uh, GPUs at the same time by specifying the number of, of C GPUs and the workers. So this is being used. And I have to say, I didn't explore the training with many from, from the sort of notebook perspective. So I can't answer that. So you're not really taking like a notebook, conversion to the Python file and it's distributed, right? Okay. So no, no, it's, it's directly taking the, the Linux container for the training. All right, all right. And you don't have any containerization, you know, capabilities inside the JupyterLab right now, right? To help you to build these images. So you don't have it right now, right? No. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I, actually, we have a similar setup at university, and I'm wondering if you found a solution for a fair resource re usage, because that's a huge topic in our research group. How do you actually make sure GPU res resources are fairly shared in the team? That's a very complicated question. I don't think it, I can just say we found the solution. We're working on it. I think the first step that we're trying to do is to make sure there are no users that are just assigning resources to them and then they don't use them. I think we, what we are trying to do is, once we see that there is 
uh, resources that are just staying idle. We make sure we uh, put them back in the common pool so that someone else can take advantage of them. And then second, of course, we're trying to make the pool larger. And uh, a big thing here is the GPU sharing with time slicing and MIG, where, of course, we need, with time slicing, there are some risks because still it's, you're not isolated. But it's worth it because then for testing setups, we can ensure more users actually have access to, to GPUs. Nice presentation to you all. I want to ask you if um, there you are using multiple namespaces inside of Qflow or, or just a single namespace? Uh, we have one namespace per user. Per user? And this is how isolation works, yes. Okay. Because uh, I, I want to, to talk because uh, um, I did have a, a project uh, some time ago that I, I needed to implement multi-tenancy for uh, each user can use it different S3 buckets and different namespaces. That's why I, 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 um, I was asked about that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So um, just a small question regarding the uh, GPU pooling and how do you do the isolation. So underneath the hood, what does run in these GPUs? Do you really do vGPU? Do you like allocate specific GPU resources for a pod? How do you do these, you know, splitting, isolation and, you know, uh, underneath the hood, we're not using vGPUs. We are using time slicing and uh, multiple instance uh, GPUs, so MIG. Uh, so it's just we have the GPUs connected to the nodes, and then they are being advertised that they, they are available. When you use the time slicing or MIG from the GPU operator, they are advertising that there are GPUs either time shared or MIG, and then the pod can request them and get them. That's it. So the isolation, in terms of time sharing, you can expect that if one tenant is greedy, then others will be starving. So there is no isolation here. We can, and we are thinking of having a mechanism where we're trying on top of what is by default kill processes that are trying to get more from the GPUs that allowed. But other than this, you have isolation only if you use MIG, which is more at the hardware level. What was it? MIG. 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 Okay. Multi instance and GPUs, yes. Okay. Which are available only for A100s and H100s. And this, like, completely open sourced? I don't think so. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Thanks. Just a question. Um, how are you managing the number of pods per node uh, you are running? Because uh, I suppose you have uh, a couple of models running at the same time, right? Ooh, yeah, but I think the limit on the node is... Uh, so we have an upper limit of the node. I don't remember if I heard yeah, how many per pods. Hmm? Uh, 110 pods Something like per this, node. Yeah, yeah. How many yeah, so, can so run you, are, then? you are not reaching that limit? Uh, no. no. But also you have, in terms, in terms of CPU or memory, if you can or cannot um, schedule more on that node. So I think we're not reaching the limit because we're reaching the other limits before. Okay. And just another question is, if you are using Kale for building your Kubeflow pipelines? If we were using Kubernetes Kale, for... Kale. Kale is a, a, a plugin for notebooks, uh, for Jupyter notebooks, I think, for building... Qflow pipelines. I am not sure. No? Okay. Thank you. If you want to chit chat with us, make sure to find us after the presentations and after the Qflow summit. Thank you. <laughs>